Okay, are we about ready to get started? Hi, everybody. Okay. All right. Well, I'm Joy Marlin with the Wichita Midland Mediation Office. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, great. Well, it's great to be here and see everyone. Um, I began researching vicarious trauma and burnout for my own self-preservation a few years ago and found a new way of being with this work. So today I'm sharing that collection of wisdom and research I came across that is a life preserver you can toss to yourself or to a colleague when it's been a challenging time at work. Please know that as we get started, some of this material may be difficult to hear now or down the road. You might sometimes feel defensive or caught off guard like me, and you might mute from time to time if it's a little much and that's okay, take care of you. And remember, you're not alone. This information is simply a door opening for all of us. This presentation will be dense. I have a lot to share, so I'll move quickly. We'll reserve a little bit of time at the end for sharing your reflections on the material. So according to a study by the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation and ABA a few years ago, legal professionals see three to four times higher rates of substance use disorders and mental health issues than the general population and are more than twice as likely to suffer from these same issues as physicians. Attorneys in the first 10 years of practice are the most at-risk group. Other studies have shown significantly higher rates of vicarious trauma and burnout among legal professionals compared with mental health providers and social workers who are working with the exact same clients. The ABA stance on this study is that these numbers are incompatible with a sustainable professional culture and too many people are suffering unnecessarily. The bottom line is that well-being is a core component of competence. We'll talk a lot about vicarious trauma, how to spot when we or our organization is dealing with it and how to handle it. You can't avoid vicarious trauma, but you can manage it. And that will be your own trauma stewardship. And we'll reference the book by the same name by Laura Vandernoot Lipsky a lot in this material. We're also going to talk about burnout. And so you're aware, there's a lot of overlap in terms of ways of preventing and treating burnout and vicarious trauma. But first, let's be clear about the difference between the two. Vicarious trauma is trauma-based. Burnout is generally not based on trauma exposure. It's more about chronic exhaustion, cynicism, and inefficacy, and can sometimes be relieved in part by relaxing downtime. Vicarious trauma, on the other hand, is generally not as easily relieved by relaxing downtime. The traumatized brain and body do not want to rest. They want to remain vigilant. So let's start with vicarious trauma, which is a real occupational hazard in our field. And its symptoms are nearly identical to PTSD. It can actually change who you are. Our social biology causes us to connect to the suffering of others, which is exactly what makes us susceptible to it. I keep a post-it note in a drawer right here that I'm in and out of all day, every day, that says being trauma-informed means not taking things personally. Our clients are almost always dealing with some level of trauma, again, why it's so important to depersonalize. And we're absorbing that trauma, which is impacting our brains and bodies. You're processing your client's energy neurologically, and you're not always aware of it. Your nervous system is constantly scanning for threats in your environment, and it's processing their energy, which it sometimes registers as a threat. So I have a cousin who's an attorney in California, and she was in a CLE several years ago where a therapist was presenting. And the therapist said that working in family law is like being in the woods with a hungry bear. Our nervous system's wired to adapt in the same ways. And a lot of damage can be done by being steeped in that environment every day without having a good set of tools for how to manage our trauma exposure. Talking with panicked, upset clients, working with very aggressive opposing counsel, working with people from all walks of life who are struggling and traumatized while a wonderful community service takes a toll on all of us. Keep in mind that the trauma exposure response diminishes our brain's ability to be creative and see nuance in our work and in life. 
which means our ability to recognize when we're starting to spin out can be diminished as well. So you might think you're upset before bed because nobody picked anything up around the house, um, but maybe it wasn't just the mess, but the work coming out at home. So as we walk through the next two lists, I encourage you to keep these handy so that you can check in with yourself from time to time as to how you and your team are managing this work. Here are a few warning signs you're on the path to vicarious trauma. The sense you can never do enough. Maybe you've had a series of case outcomes you're not happy with, an unusual number of difficult clients lately. Hypervigilance, so really being on the lookout for clients to lie because so many have been lately. So you become hypervigilant with your friends and your loved ones. Also being so focused on your job that it feels impossible to be fully present for anything else. Having a family member ask where you are when you're sitting right in front of them. Over planning and feeling like you have to do everything right away when you're on vacation. If you hurry up and relax, you can get out of the present moment and keep anticipating what's next, which is exactly what vicarious trauma will keep you doing. Staying out of the present moment so your nervous system can stay vigilant. Staying in the present moment as often as you can throughout your day will help you mitigate your vicarious trauma. And we'll go into more detail on this later. Minimizing, when we minimize the fact that we're dreaming about cases or the fact that we're not sleeping well. The author of Trauma Stewardship says this can also, also show up when you start downplaying things that don't fall into the most extreme categories of hardship because we're losing our compassion and our ability to empathize. We can get so saturated that we can't possibly take in any more information. So we minimize what we're hearing or seeing to avoid going beyond what we can take. Apathy. Maybe you have a client who's leading you down the primrose path. So you say, you know, let's just cut to the chase. So you're running out of empathy. You're getting short with clients. Chronic exhaustion, where you just wake up feeling tired. Um, maybe you're dealing with some physical ailments. This is a big one for burnout too, when you just literally have no fuel left at all. Having dissociative moments where you check out and you're not tracking with a client or with somebody at home. Dissociative moments are common, but they become a problem when we barrel through them and act like they didn't happen. Remember that every organism exposed to trauma will try to protect itself. We can all expect these moments when we're exposed to trauma. So notice them, avoid isolation, and use your tools and seek support when you need it. Anger and cynicism, where you hear yourself saying, you know, I've heard this story before, right? Maybe you're experiencing some angry outbursts, aggression, poor job performance, deterioration of your personal relationships. Having an inflated sense of self-importance, and we'll talk about this later with the Miracle Worker Reverie, but this is where you're saying to yourself, you know, if I don't do this right or take this late call, the whole world's going to come crashing down for this family. Remember, we don't have control over other people's lives. The author of Trauma Stewardship says we can also begin to feel dependent on other people's struggle and their need for us to help them to maintain a sense of purpose. Noticing that you're sometimes behaving in ways that you never imagined you would when you first started this work. So maybe in the beginning, you didn't jump to conclusions so quickly. Maybe you were more open-minded. Maybe you truly believed what you were doing mattered and was helping. The inability to embrace complexity. So the author of Trauma Stewardship talks about this showing up when you crave clear signs of good or bad, right and wrong, and feel an urgent need to choose sides. So our clients are either victims or they're aggressors. There's just no human nuance. Pay attention if you hear yourself saying, you know, I love the dad I'm working with, but I just can't stand the mom. The inability to listen and deliberate avoidance. So maybe hoping your client won't answer a call, hoping for a cancellation because you can get a little bit more of that uninterrupted head down work done, right? But be careful because over time, it could indicate you're headed towards a bigger problem. This can show up in your personal life too when you quit answering the phone, when you're going out with people less, or just picking people you know you'll have simpler conversations with. Guilt, so feeling guilty that you're able to take a vacation or that you have resources your clients don't have, that you've left work behind on your time off. The author of Trauma Stewardship says there's a fault to this. When we feel guilty, we can't authentically connect with others and our clients deserve our presence and authenticity. Guilt is one of the strongest indicators of a trauma exposure response, so watch for it. 
even the way that people respond to us when we tell them what we do for a living can increase the feeling of isolation. So if anybody's ever said to you, oh, I could never do that. You're such a saint. Or how do you ever sleep? I had a friend ask me years ago, how do you ever sleep worrying about all the families you work with, which really was not helpful. I can tell you that. Um, you know, you might find yourself watering down or even lying about what you do because it just feels exhausting and you'd rather not get the feedback. And really, people just won't get it anyway. So let's talk about the signs a professional team is experiencing vicarious trauma. The team is more aggressive towards each other. They take more sick days. There's a lack of vision for the future. There's a sense clients never get better. People become inflexible. The group's not functioning as well as it used to. The team seems to polarize people more, seeing people, again, either as good or bad. So what do you do if a coworker is struggling with vicarious trauma and they don't see it? I think the first thing we can do is normalize it. We can talk about it, model positive behavior. You can talk about how you managed a really difficult client, how you depersonalized and managed your thoughts in the moment. Organizationally, peer support groups and regular debriefings with colleagues is very effective at managing vicarious trauma, including simply checking in with one another, just asking, you know, how are you doing? Weaving gratitude into staff meetings can be a powerful tool for trauma stewardship, where we just take a moment at the end where everybody can recognize what's going well. Educating support staff so they can be on the lookout for vicarious trauma, not only for themselves, but also the attorneys and other staff they work with and to know who to talk to with any concerns. Structuring work and projects where people can get some breathing room when possible. It's also a good policy to encourage the use of vacation time. That is the time when you heal. So let's talk about professional resilience next. So remember that resilience is not a trait or just the ability to bounce back. It's a process that can be taught and it's about developing new thought habits. Listen, this work is a roller coaster for all of us. The ups and downs are normal, but these are the qualities that will promote your resilience. Having a sense of humor, having the ability to accept circumstances that cannot be changed, having the ability to develop realistic goals and move toward them, having meaningful connections with others. And we'll talk about developing microcultures to do just that. You know, having a therapist to talk to can be extremely helpful. This is sometimes a practice among therapists themselves. Even just a couple of quick strategic sessions for sharpening your tool set can be impactful. ProQual.org has a professional quality of life quiz you can take to evaluate where you fall with your peers on the spectrum of burnout and secondary traumatic stress. I use this tool once or twice a year to keep a pulse on how I'm managing this work. And I think it can be another great tool to hang on to. When we actively use tools to man manage vicarious trauma, we can build vicarious wisdom and resilience, much like post-traumatic wisdom as well as our own trauma mastery, which can deepen our perspective on humanity and be a great gift in this life. So I wanna talk next about burnout. I mentioned earlier that there's quite a bit of overlap in terms of how to manage burnout and vicarious trauma. And I can tell you that my burnout reduced considerably when I did my vicarious trauma research, but here are a few things that stand out when it comes to burnout. So Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, LCL, has done some interesting work on professional burnout. I'm gonna share some insights from Dr. Sean Healy, who is a staff clinician for their group. So Dr. Healy says these are some key indicators you could be headed to burnout. Overcommitment. So I have a great aunt who was a criminologist and sociologist. She traveled the world teaching and publishing. And she would tell me, Joy, no is not spelled Y-E-S. When you're taking on more than you know you can. Lack of control, doing too much because a demand is being put on you. You're experiencing just a nonstop excessive workload. Lack of community, feeling isolated. There's a lack of validation from colleagues or managers. Maybe you feel like you're just kind of doing it all alone. Your professional values not aligning with your personal values. Perfectionism, this is one to really watch. So perfection is not the same as excellence. As author Richard Rohr says, perfection is the ability to incorporate imperfection. 
two little recognition and validation. So maybe just getting those mass thank you emails and your positive feedback, not feeling personal or sincere. Um, Dr. Healy says burnout is literally when we've burned out of all of our fuel and it doesn't get filled back up. Burnout is not the same as stress. It's about just being absolutely drained. So the signs you're burned out, according to Dr. Healy, are number one, feeling unwell and just chronically exhausted, becoming pessimistic about your abilities, chronic cynicism, having trouble focusing, feeling like you're more distracted in general. It starts seeming pointless to care about a task anymore, and it's just more difficult to complete tasks. Maybe it used to take less energy. And every day just kind of feels like a bad day. The good news is you can prevent burnout. So he says you can do this by, first off, respecting your downtime and leaving work at work. I've noticed when I've quit thinking about work for a number of hours or even all day, I feel much healthier. Maintaining community, again, watching for isolation and staying connected to your microculture. Avoid multitasking. The brain's not designed for this. I know easier said than done in the legal field, right? But you want to try to focus on one task at a time and be more present. Research by psychologist Gloria Mark shows that three things happen when we continually multitask. We make more mistakes. It actually takes longer to complete each individual task and we experience higher levels of stress. Setting clear boundaries and maintaining them, remembering how to spell no, right? Dr. Healy says the way to treat burnout is first improve your sleep. I know we've been hearing this our entire lives, right guys? But it really does go a long way toward mood regulation and getting you the fuel you need for this work. Scheduling time for tasks and not just your appointments. So instead of just squeezing tasks in between appointments, maybe turn off email not notifications from time to time um, and use batch emailing. Do less multitasking and focus more. Ask for help. He says when we share a load, it reduces the weight. So let somebody know when you're struggling and you're feeling burned out. He also says that recovery includes changing the pattern of your work. So taking an intentional break, whether that's during the day, on the weekend, or planned time off, focusing on your boundaries, prioritizing taking care of yourself, because work and rest are two sides of the same coin. Reevaluating your priorities and increasing your community. So authors and researchers of emotions in the workplace, Liz Foslian and Molly West Duffy, Talk about having a diverse portfolio of meaning in your life. This is kind of like that concept of having a diverse financial portfolio where your work is part of it, but so is your time with your pet, your hobbies, and your loved ones. Having that active rest and meaning portfolio means that when you receive critical feedback at work or a disappointing case outcome, it doesn't have to blanket your whole life. You don't have to awfulize it because you're diversified. So next we're gonna talk about several different barometers you can use to be better aware of how you're managing this work emotionally. All of these are your alarms that will tell you when to use your tools. So we're gonna be talking about awareness of our thoughts, feedback from loved ones, feedback from colleagues and physiological feedback from your body. So let's start with the most important one, which is awareness of our thoughts. Also sometimes referred to as mind sight. This is that presence and non-judgmental inquiry of how we're doing every day. So when we're steeped in conflict and anxiety, the nervous system adapts to what it perceives as being continuous threat levels and will wire to scan more regularly for threats and cause us to believe a crisis and conflict is there when it's not. So we frequently see this in our clients, but it can also happen uniquely to us in this work. Vicarious trauma can shift our perception of people and the world. And I have one example of how this has impacted me personally. So years ago, I was at an ice cream shop with my husband and my son, and I noticed this beautiful young couple and they had linked their arms and they were sharing an ice cream cone and they seemed to be reminiscing about their recent first date. And my first reaction was, you know, that's adorable. And then I thought, guys, just stop while you're ahead. <laughs> you get down the road a few years, 
from now, you're going to have to go see an attorney. You're going to have to talk to a judge. You may have to come talk with somebody like me. Just save your save yourselves the the heartache, right? Um, and you know, later on, I looked back on that and thought, you know, I got a good chuckle from it. But I also thought, you know, maybe it's time to do a little bit of work and kind of check in with how I'm managing things. So I think that stepping back and noticing your own thoughts can be powerful. The ice cream shop was just an invitation for me to use my tools. So the psychiatrist and neuroscientist, Dr. Judson Brewer, who wrote the book, Unwinding Anxiety, has researched the connection between burnout and anxiety extensively among physicians. And remember, legal professionals deal with this more than twice as often as physicians. He says that anxiety is a habit that can be managed over time by being aware of when we're in an anxiety loop and getting curious about why we're anxious. So once you're aware you're in a loop, you can step out for just a moment to non-judgmentally observe yourself and ask, you know, is the story I'm telling myself about this situation or even my stress level, what is actually happening? And is my line of thinking right now really going to serve me moving forward? The goal is to help you step out of the loop just long enough to readjust your thinking in the moment, keeping in mind that we can't believe everything we think. You know, the brain is a highly efficient organ. It jumps to conclusions and labels how we're feeling very quickly in order to keep us safe. So it's important to remember that our thoughts aren't always facts. Awareness of when you're in the loop can be powerful so you can hack it. And we'll talk about a number of hacks for the loop in this training. We also have to actively challenge our own negative thoughts and cynicism and reframe our own thinking about this work. So when you're up at night, ruminating about a case and you're thinking, what might this kid go through tomorrow if I don't prevail? Or if I don't make the right decision or if I miss something? You can actively challenge that thought and remind yourself that you're giving tools to the families you're working with that they've likely never had before. And that you can open the door, but you can't make anyone walk through it. Remember that our brains are wired with a negativity bias to keep us safe, but can lead us to awfulize when it's not actually necessary. So it's important to consciously remind yourself that you're in a high conflict situation, which means it's going to be even more important that you use your tools today and after you go home tonight so you can go back to being you. This will help you stay on the middle road on those tough days. Psychologist Kristen Neff talks about the importance of self-compassion. Hear me out with this. Every professional makes mistakes. Every court system, every human system makes mistakes. We all have moments where we kick ourselves because we could have asked a better question or when we ruminate after a disappointing case outcome. That inner critic can be loud. We've got to accept that we're not perfect. Self-compassion decreases cortisol. It reduces your sympathetic nervous system reactivity. It likely increases oxytocin and activates the physiological system that tells us we're safe. Dr. Neff says that when we criticize ourselves, we activate our threat response and we isolate. A study of soldiers who returned from combat in Iraq and Afghanistan showed that how they treated themselves around their trauma experience was a very powerful predictor of whether or not they experienced PTSD nine months later. Listen to this. It was more powerful than how much action they'd seen. How you relate to yourself in the midst of the many difficult experiences in this work is critical. This work can sometimes feel like a battle. So ask yourself who you want inside your head, the ally who's on your side or the shaming critic. Some inner critic is good. We all know this. However, I love what author Richard Rohr says about our inner critics. He says, if this inner critic and this critical voice has kept you safe for many years as your inner authority, you may end up not being able to hear the real voice of God or the universe, whatever your perspective is. When we acknowledge we're flawed and try to learn from our experiences, we'll be more motivated and connected. A supportive, friendly attitude toward yourself is a deep source of strength and resilience, and it's a very trainable skill. Too much of your inner critic leads you to anxiety and depression. Your inner ally expands your vision, increases your psychological flexibility, and your creativity. 
if we can practice what the Dalai Lama refers to as internal disarmament and meet others' negative energy with compassion and see their humanity and our own humanity instead of getting defensive, and if we can meet our mistakes and shortcomings with compassion instead of shaming criticism, it decreases the suffering of all involved. Kindness is perceived by the brain as a big reward when you're in an anxiety loop. So it's another great hack into the loop. Another way to actively challenge our own thoughts is to consider how you attach to the amazing moments in this work and also the challenging and disappointing moments. It can really help us avoid the anxiety loop. I find it's pretty easy to attach to both. So several years ago, I had some parents return to mediation and they shared with me, you know, we realized after mediation that we may not have been destined to be married for the rest of our lives, but we were destined to be the parents of these children and we can be very proud of that. So that day I felt like I literally just floated out of the office on a cloud, you know, it just, it felt amazing. It was so inspiring. But remember that attachment leads to suffering. Good to not attach too much to any state, good or bad. And this applies to our case outcomes and feedback from clients. It can be good to not float too high when you experience an incredible, inspiring case outcome or ruminate too much when you experience a disappointing one. We can walk a healthy middle road. Also, don't buy into the belief that if you put your heart into your work, you should get that back. You don't want to rely on your case outcomes and client feedback to replenish yourself. Instead, you want to replenish with your own personal stuff, your family time, exercise, hobbies. It really helps us keep a healthier perspective on the work we do so we can maintain that diverse portfolio of meaning. Again, it comes back to being on the healthy middle road. Also, be aware of the risk of the miracle worker reverie. So according to the Vicarious Trauma Institute, the miracle worker reverie happens to people affected by vicarious trauma. It is very easy in this work to begin to believe that people will do what they're supposed to do because of you. If your clients can't seem to reason and you can't rescue the people you're working with and you've been basing your self-esteem on what you do instead of who you are, you can really suffer. Be very cautious of the miracle worker reverie. In order to keep yourself in a healthy space, be careful of the thanks you receive from clients, although you all well deserve it. Keep your congratulatory self-talk measured out in healthy doses. And work to be a professional who has a lot of what Judson Brewer refers to as confident humility. So the Latin root of the word humble is from the earth. So he says it's about being grounded. It means knowing you're fallible. It means recognizing your strengths and at the same time, remembering you're human. People misunderstand humility. They think it means that you have low self-esteem and you're kind of a wallflower. But if you're not humble, it's impossible to learn. The goal is confident humility, being secure enough in your own ego to acknowledge the things you don't know, and in particular in the legal field, the things that you can't fix. If you can do that, you become a lifelong learner and you will soak up things from everyone you meet. Arbitrator and mediator Chuck Crumpton says, in this life and in this work, you can either be humble or humiliated. So let's talk about your next barometer, which is feedback from loved ones. So several years ago, I was headed to the office and was dropping my son off at school on the way. And he was repeating himself to me probably for the third or fourth time. And he finally said, mom, have you been mediating too much lately? And you know, we talked earlier about how it can be really hard to take in any more inputs and conversations because this work can literally saturate us. Loved ones might be telling you you've been quiet or distracted lately, commenting on how they've noticed a pattern of you not sleeping well, noticing your personal relationships taking a hit. Loved ones telling you you've been agitated, angry, reactive, not as apt to spend time with them as you used to be and isolating. While it may be hard in the moment, Trust me, I know, it's actually a gift. It's a chance to get that awareness and start using your tools. I've taught my husband and my 18 year old son over the last couple of years, some of the signs of vicarious trauma and burnout. And they've, got, they've gotten really great at not only spotting it sooner than I usually do, um, but also delivering 
their observations with a really soft pitch, right? They get that this is difficult work. And most of the time nowadays, nowadays I'm proud to report that instead of feeling defensive, I'm really appreciative. And I use it as a reminder to go to my tools. The author of Trauma Stewardship shares her own story of the voices of her friends and loved ones and eventually even her clients getting louder until finally she had to face their question of, are you sure this, this work hasn't gotten to you? After lots of suggestions to take some time off, think about another line of work and just stop taking it all so seriously. The problem is that we go along not able to hear them because they don't get it, right? In my case, only mediators really understand what I go through when I talk to them about my work. So it's easy to tell yourself no one else gets it, but they do. In Trauma Stewardship, the author talks about the importance of having a microculture. These are loved ones and people in your immediate personal community who can shower you with encouragement and keep you accountable. The goal here is to prevent your own isolation, a warning sign of both vicarious trauma and burnout. She says, we all need our microculture we can debrief with, laugh with, consult with, and just become better people with. These are also people who refuse to go along with our harmful internal habits. And remember, as I heard someone say recently, there's sanity in community. Okay, so let's talk about feedback from colleagues as your next barometer. Speaking of microcultures, feedback from colleagues can be just as powerful. So this can look like a coworker asking if you're okay, noticing you've been more stressed lately, taking a lot more on. And this is a good thing, by the way. We should be doing this. When we support one another within our organization, again, each other, now oftentimes our colleagues can pick up on our struggle before we do. So we can be a great asset to one another in this way and just build that professional resilience and increased longevity for all of us. So let's talk about, oh, and I love this quote. One can save one's life as a human being along with one's professional existence if one seizes every opportunity to act humanly towards those who need another human being. Everyone in his own environment must strive to practice true humanity toward others. The future of the world depends on it. All right, let's talk about your last barometer, that physiological feedback from your body. So keep in mind that energetically, lots of things are happening when you're working with a traumatized, angry, scared, or confused client, and your nervous system is constantly to protect you. The other person's body language, the tone of their email, the tone of voice, their eye contact is impacting you, whether it's making you more comfortable or more anxious, more than you know. If you don't take that energy in and then release it and let it go, it sits in your body and you'll feel the tension in your head, your neck, your shoulders, your stomach, your sleep. These are great barometers for how we're doing. It's so important that we listen to our bodies and notice our sleep habits every day. So in the book, What Happened to You by Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry, they talk about sensitized nervous systems. So our clients are oftentimes dealing with the sensitized nervous system. So instead of the moderate stressors that you and I are used to every day, where maybe we're anticipating heavy traffic on the way home, our kid comes home with a bad grade, right? That we experience and recover from over and over. They're dealing with the big stressors. There's no way to make rent. There's domestic violence at home. Uh, there's a knock on the door from Child Protective Services, right? And before they can fully recover, there's another one and another one until their nervous system baseline is way, way higher, right? They may react much more strongly than a person without a sensitized nervous system, to little things like a lack of sleep the night before. And they'll spend more time in fight or flight mode. So things as little as remembering their appointment with you on Monday is forgotten until the last minute. And then they don't show because they didn't arrange for transportation and childcare because their brains just won't let them do it. The key to life, I think, is to depersonalize, depersonalize, depersonalize. When you have a client who flies off the handle, or is highly emotionally charged. 
and you're feeling some of that energy come at, coming at you, remember that they're dealing with the sensitized nervous system and it's not about you. When you're dealing with opposing counsel or other professional who seems to be irrational about a case, Remember that they're probably dealing with the sensitized nervous system and vicarious trauma and maybe burnout and have emotionally invested too much in the case. They're no longer on the middle road. So it's harder for them to see the perspective of the other side and think clearly. So remember, it's not about you. You can work to react less. You can keep your thinking brain more online. Our brain functioning depends on whether we're in a moderate state or a sensitized state based on our exposure to trauma and stress. We too can over time develop sensitized nervous systems that can eventually lead to impairment with our work. One way that you can listen to your body and use it as a barometer, get to know your nervous system well enough to know when it's sensitized is to notice those bodily changes when your sympathetic nervous system is activated and you're stressed. Uh then again, when your parasympathetic nervous system is activated and you're calm and get a baseline for both. Once you've got your baselines, when you feel your sympathetic nervous system kick in at work, you can actively manage your own thoughts about what's going on using some self-talk. Tell yourself, this is not my story. You can take a deep breath to regulate and stop your own alarm. Remember to trust your training and trust your professional process. Remember that our clients are on their own path. We have the deep honor and privilege of walking alongside them for a short while, but everyone's on their own path. This is their story, not yours. The more I remember that every day, the more I enjoy this work and enjoy my life, honestly. I heard a quote by a psychologist recently who said that his clients don't come to him for his credentials and his degrees. They come to him to be in the presence of somebody with a regulated nervous system. Mm -hmm. It's our job to have the more regulated nervous system in the room. Sociologist Mark, Martha Beck says the untroubled presence helps people thrive. Managing our nervous system response and taking care of ourselves in the moment is critical to bringing the most helpful energy and presence to our clients. Now, I think everybody's familiar with the brain's amygdala. That's our smoke detector, the fight or flight center of the brain, and then the cortex which is the portion of the brain that's responsible for reasoned thought, planning, and problem solving. So the amygdala has a very unique advantage in the brain in that when it's activated, it kind of takes over. It can shift the frontal cortex's functioning in one one hundredth of a second in the face of conflict. You almost literally stop thinking and you just react. Our functional IQs can drop by up to 60 points. We know this happens to our clients, but we also need to be mindful of our amygdala response in this work as well. It's possible to reduce your amygdala's response by way of the self-talk and other approaches we're talking about here, as well as mindfulness. So some functional, F, some functional MRI research points to physical brain changes that happen in response to a regular mindfulness practice, even in as little as just a few minutes a day. It's simply a way to exercise your brain. Mindfulness has had a profound impact on my work in recent years. Remember, vicarious trauma tries to keep us out of the present moment. Learning to be truly present, even in the smallest moments of your day, can give you an advantage over your trauma exposure and your burnout. I've listened to a few mindfulness podcasts in recent years. You can find them anywhere, but my favorite is 10% Happier by Dan Harris. So he was a war correspondent and a major news network anchor who had a panic attack on live TV and realized it was time for him to get his own tool set. It's a great resource. I highly recommend it. We know that when we use mindfulness and slow our brain waves, it can help us change our relationship with our thoughts, especially our thoughts about our work, and that can change your life. You can also work to prevent your own fight or flight response in the moment. So recognize when you begin to leave the room, when you feel changes in your body and your heart rate, when your thoughts are distracted. Remember the more affected you are by vicarious trauma, the harder it is to prevent your own panic. So when you find yourself saying, okay, what's next? Where do I take this? How do I manage this call or this client? What's the next great question? Try to trust the process more Trust your training 
and stay curious. Curiosity is the key for both our clients and all of us in this work. I tell mediation clients every day that their most powerful tool in mediation is their own curiosity. That getting genuinely curious about the other party's perspective can unlock new creative solutions. It's just important that we are curious. The more curious you are, the more you'll relax and the better questions you'll ask, the better you'll be able to really hear your clients instead of just tripping through the anxiety moment and you'll enjoy your more. You really will. Therapeutic tools for traumatized patients. Actually physically heals the brain. It turns out it's one of our greatest tools way to manage our, get into a loop with each other when we're feeling anxiety. So if you even think of them as being two separate entities, which maybe they're actually not, but if you can diminish either your brain, your thoughts, um, activity, or your body, that tenseness in your shoulders, your breathing, you can start to shift the communication between the two and lower your anxiety in the moment. So when one eases up, the other will likely begin to follow suit and you'll have more mastery of your thoughts. So I, I find that when I felt my sympathetic nervous system kick in, that it works better for me to manage my body's response first. So to change my breathing, soften my posture, this is another great hack for the loop. A quick note on breathing. According to James Nestor, author of the book, Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art, there's such a thing as the artful exhalation. So he's a medical journalist who spent years inter interviewing pulmonologists, respiratory therapists, psychiatrists, and anthropologists about how we breathe. And here's where the science solidly stands. Cavities and perfectly straight teeth. They breathed much better than we do. They took much slower, deeper breaths. And as a result, they had stronger musculature in their mouths and very few respiratory allergy and sinus issues. And if you can't tell by the sound of my voice today, I'm envious of that. <laughs> I've got some sinus issues today. Um, and he argues, as do all of the experts he interviewed, that by getting back to that ancestral breathing, we can seriously improve our physical and mental health. And the science backs this, like I said. So when you breathe through your nose instead of your mouth, you filter viral and bacterial particulates so you're less likely to get sick. You oxygenate your body significantly more. And the pace at which the oxygen enters your body, its temperature and its moisture level is perfect for what your body needs for maximum health. Nose breathing that is slower with a deep exhale, which is really the most important part, and deep inhales that move your diaphragm and your abdomen throughout the day, decreases cortisol, blood pressure, blood sugar, anxiety, depression, and stress. The diaphragm's movement massages nearby organs and cleans the lymphatic system. Mm -hmm. It can also have a wonderful impact on your sleep, especially if you can get in the habit of practicing that throughout the day. Psychiatrists he interviewed said that when they treat patients for anxiety, in their mind, the only way to get to truly get maximum benefit from talk therapy and pharmaceutical treatments is through proper breathing. Your breath either activates your sympathetic nervous system and your threat response with that fast, shallow mouth breathing that we probably all do as we're, you know, hurrying throughout our day, right? Um, or it activates your parasympathetic nervous system with the deeper exhales and inhales and that's slow breathing. You know, when we're talking or working out, it's a lot more difficult to do, right? But throughout the work day, a great way to get a handle on any stress or anxiety, as well as oxygenating that wonderful prefrontal cortex and improving your health is practicing and getting into the habit of slow breathing. I particularly high conflict situation, opening it's my mind much more space on. It's super easy and it's well worth practicing, whether that's at your desk throughout the day, on your drive to and from work, while you're home binging Netflix, 
um, anytime you remember to do it. And the more you do it, the more it will just become instinctive and a habit. And as quirky as this sounds, I know I'm actively taking care of myself when I practice slow breathing throughout my work day in a small but profound way. And I love this quote at the end. Curiosity will conquer fear even more than bravery will. Okay, so let's talk about in the moment care. So in the moment, you can protect yourself. Some clients can be very aggressive overtly or covertly. I once heard a very seasoned attorney mediator say that clients can be scary, and this is true. So unmirroring, this is where you break away from whatever you're doing with your clients. You know, when your anxiety is heightened and you might be feeling hooked by the emotions in the room because emotions are very, very contagious, you can break your own mirror responses by doing things as simple as crossing or uncrossing your legs, changing your breathing, and taking in the good. You know, we're all trained to look for the problem, but instead look also for what's going well and tell them. Notice if you're sitting the same way your clients are, if you're breathing similarly, this will tell you how much everyone is mirroring one another in the room. I'm a huge fan of breaks in mediation. It can be a great way for everybody to reset and just get unhooked from the emotions. I also every day imagine myself rolling up a car window when I meet with clients. So you imagine yourself rolling up this thin piece of glass where you're present, your mind is alert for them, you're in the moment, but the window is there as a simple natural buffer. We all know that getting enough water throughout the day flushes out stress chemicals. We know that coordinated physical activities like yoga and Tai Chi that help us get down into our bodies through movement is a very effective treatment for trauma survivors. Getting enough protein throughout the day. So veterans diagnosed with PTSD who get enough protein throughout the day have significantly fewer flashbacks and nightmares. So I think we can take some cues from some of this research. Taking a deep breath in and out right before picking up a call or opening up an email can help you regulate throughout the day. Like I mentioned before, breathing is one of your fastest tools for kickstarting that wonderful parasympathetic response. Also remember, the goal, as I heard somebody say recently, is to observe it, don't absorb it. Presence. Practicing your presence in lots of moments throughout the day will help keep you grounded in your body and regulated as you experience trauma exposure in this work. You can fight vicarious trauma's efforts to pull you out of the present moment. The author of Trauma Stewardship says this, being present is a radical act. It allows us to soften the impact of trauma and set the stage for healing and transformation. Best of all, our quality of presence is something we can cultivate moment by moment. It permits us to greet what arises in our lives with our most enlightened selves, thereby allowing us to have the best chance of truly repairing the world. And I think that's what everybody here signed up to do. So I want to share this quote with you to kind of wrap all of this up together. Be empty of worrying. Think of who created thought. Why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Move outside the triangle of fear thinking. Live in silence. Flow down and down in always widening rings of being. So remember who you really are. Remember, as sociologist Martha Beck says, that on an energetic level, it's only when we show up as a person who has set themselves free that we have a chance of setting other people free. The world needs the peacemakers and the problem solvers. We need you to be good to you so you can all continue to do the inspiring, life-changing work that you do. Okay, that's everything I've got, guys. I think we should have a few minutes left if anybody has any thoughts, reflections about any of that. Thank you so much, Joy. This every year is just inspiring and it's a wonderful reset and reminder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other thoughts?
Okay, well, I think we might wrap up about 10 minutes early. Thank you all for letting me share all this stuff that I love to talk about. <laughs> and it's great seeing you all once again. So have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>